I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, in 2008, I was a, I am and was a science journalist. Uh, I was reporting on biology, but didn't know a lot about biology. I had never worked in a lab, and yet I wanted to know more. And so I looked at my options, and my options were pretty slim. Uh, all I could do is either I could go and go back to college, and that would be four years, or finish that, and then if I wanted to do my own experiments, then I would have another five, six to seven years. That's 10 years before I'd ever get to actually try my own experiments. 10 years is unacceptable. So one night I invited a handful of people over to my house. They came off the internet, um, and we did our first experiment. We turned a bunch of bacteria green. And since then, the experiments have grown. We moved from my living room to gen space in Brooklyn. It's a dedicated lab for citizen scientists. This is the lab today. Although it has the same equipment as a molecular biology lab, it doesn't look like one. We bootstrapped it from found materials, uh, glass windows and sliding patio doors make up the walls. And if you, you can't see the benches, but the benches are actually industrial kitchen counters. Um, about, around GenSpace, we built a thriving community um, and that community has grown beyond our walls. It inspired dozens of labs now that are around the world. Um, artists and designers are among the first people that came to GenSpace. And at first I didn't really understand why they were interested in molecular biology. Uh, but last year a group of us spun out something different from GenSpace. We spun out a uh, bio art and design group um, and we called it Cut, ba Cut Paste Grow. Uh, we curated our first gallery show in Brooklyn in 2013. We got a good audience. And here's our mascot, uh, which is the fir world's first genetically modified mosaic. It's a unicorn made out of petri dishes, um, and we painted them with the same bacteria we were engineering in my apartment way back long ago. Same bacteria, but an, a new application. And we did this as a public performance piece at South by Southwest Interactive. One project begets another project and uh, at the BioArt show in Rotterdam this last fall, um, bio uh, slime mold artist Heather Barnett and I worked on our own project together. We called it Being Slime Mold. And I'm not gonna give you the details because there's a movie and we're featured in the movie called The Creeping Garden, which uh, actually debuted this month at the Imagine Science Film Festival in the US. So thinking about why I got involved with the artists and the designers, I realized it was partially born out of disappointment. I was trying to understand where synthetic biology was going, what the big idea was, a lot of what Daisy was already talking about. Um, I was looking around at some of the early ideas, the, the quotes that came out of early synthetic biology. And this is probably my favorite utopian quote. This comes from Tom Knight, probably the granddaddy of, of synthetic biology. And he says, we don't know how to run an economic system based on abundance rather than scarcity, but we'd best learn rapidly. And I, I think that's a really interesting uh, point. Tom Knight here represents the community's hopes for using the technology to reshape society. Um, of course, Hope is one thing, reality is another thing. Amaris, one of the first synthetic biology companies, and the companies like it, we're going to turn microbes, which you see on the left, uh, into our next source of fuel and replace oil. The same microbes were gonna make uh, cheap and abundant medicines. These were expansive visions, uh, but I think now in retrospect, they were somehow shallow, incomplete, riddled with lots of ethical and economic issues. And five years later, what's the major commercial product for synthetic biology? Scent molecules for perfumes. So Coco Chanel famously said, a woman who doesn't wear perfume has no future. I'm not sure what she means, but she can rest, be rest assured the future's secure. Um, the tr I don't have a problem with minor industrial applications for synthetic biology, but I have a the sense that somehow we've lost sight on where it's actually, how it can actually be transformative, how it can actually create a greener, more equitable future. And so I turned to the artists um, because I was looking for better visions. Again, I think I'm influenced by you, Daisy. 
Uh, and when I looked, what I found weren't just visions of a better future. I found visions of different futures. There were narratives everywhere um, and, and projections and critiques. So here's a great one. The, the, the visions, are, I think, are, are political one. So this is Heather Dewey Hagborg. We, Paula already described it. But she, I think she, what she's imagining is using DNA uh, in a way to create sort of a surveillance state. So I think that's probably a critical vision. But then the visions are also personal. And this is Revital Cohen. And she's imagining this, this sort of Pandora's box. When, when children come of age, they open up the box. They listen to that earphone. And it sort of tells them what their genomic fates will be. The visions are structural, and this I love. Uh, so Liam Young and a group of architects and science fiction writers um, and artists as well, they imagine the city of the future that's kind of a symbiont. Not only does it provide space for inhabitants to live, but it also produces their natural resources for them. So here the, the inhabitants actually live in sort of a, a, coral, a coral structure. And then, of course, there's Daisy's work. And uh, this is obviously a vision about ecology. Um, so this is a, and Daisy will explain it better, so I'm going to not say too much, but uh, it's, a, it's a slug that bioremediates the forest. Um, I'm not sure if it matters that these are largely meant as critiques. I think what ulti ultimately matters are the narratives themselves, because I think they get co-opted by the broader community. Um, and no matter what we present to the community. I think that it gets co-opted. I think it, get, it, it helps produce the future. And uh, there's already evidence that some of it has. I think we're all familiar with this one. Uh, in 2000 and, and in the year 2000, Orrin Katz and Yanat Zor created a steak made from frog cells. Uh, they ate it in front of an audience, partly to critique tissue culturing as um, an unsustainable means of actually using it for meat. And then, of course, 13 years later, scientist Mark Post created a hamburger from a cell culture to demonstrate it as a feasible way of making meat. Of course, this one cost $325,000, but we'll get there. So, and in the same way, two food writers sat and ate it uh, in front of an audience. Now, I didn't, I didn't put this in my notes, but it, what was interesting was, were the critiques of these two eating occasions. So, Oren talks about how the, uh, the meat didn't quite solidify, so it was sort of like eating fabric gel. And here, the, the critics, they didn't like it because there wasn't enough salt or pepper. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, in 2010, the Cambridge iGEM engineered E. coli to bioluminesce in a rainbow of colors. Uh, they projected that one day their research would be used to bioengineer glowing trees to light the streets. This was an image that went on their website. Uh, the image was co-opted co by a crowdfunding campaign, which we heard about, to, glow, to engineer glowing uh, plants. And of course, they raised a half a million dollars, and the plants are going to be released. Ecological consequences, who knows? <laughs> Political consequences. I mean, it's a mess in Washington around this right now. So we already know that science influences the artist's visions. But we also now know that the influence goes both ways. So the question that I want to understand is how can artists use this phenomenon to further influence the scientific agenda? So what are we going to do? We, we know that whatever we produce somehow comes back and either gets co-opted and reproduced or, or, or gets changed and somehow ends up back as a funding um, ask. So here's what I'm imagining. I'm imagining a summit bringing together artists, designers, ecologists, policymakers, social scientists, synthetic biologists, synthetic biologists to to re-energize the social vision of the science. Um, I think we have a lot of vague notions about what synthetic biology could do, um, but we haven't actually laid it out explicitly. So I think what we need to do is come together and establish a framework a set of principles for the application of the science. Um, I don't think it's anything we would ram down a newman's throat, but I think it would be something like a reference, a reference that would somehow percolate into the greater discussion of actual community. So, oops, um, the, 
reason why I think about it is because we did this with the do-it-yourself biology community. So I started by talking about community labs. One of the first things we did was come together and put together a code of ethics. And that meant all of us sitting in a room and arguing for a day until we came up with these very simple statements. And I actually think that this is probably the most important document that set the agenda for the movement. I think something similar, not necessarily a code of ethics, but a, a, a set of principles for synthetic biology would help scientists actually conceive of new research. It would help the policymakers regulate the products of this research. It would help the citizens who actually are in the landscape navigate that new landscape because of the research. And I also think it would help us uh, imagine or envision a better future for that research. So the question I'm asking is with these principles, how would we reshape things like communication or the kitchen or the home? And I think as influencers of public opinion, designers have a role to play at, to demand from the scientists, scientific community something that they could actually create. Meaning instead of just saying, well, here's what I imagine thing happening, saying, here's something that I would like you to do because this is beneficial for society. But I think what, what needs to happen first is that we need to come together. So we can imagine something like this, which is another image from Under Tomorrow's Sky, or this, you might be familiar, this is Star Wars, uh, <laughs> or this, which if you live outside of Washington, D.C., you'll recognize, or something simpler like this. I, I think it's up to us, but I think first we have to start with a framework and, and develop a set of principles, and we need to do that not as siloed individual communities, not as designers here, synthetic biologists there, policymakers over here, but really come together and, and talk it out and figure it out in a, in a summit-like format. Thank you.